Hello, Carly Baker here from Ipswich Hospital. I'm afraid that being a typical emergency medicine doctor, I rostered myself on for teaching on Friday, completely oblivious to the fact that it was um, Good Friday and of course we wouldn't be having formal teaching. But I didn't want to waste a good talk and I, I put my uh, homemade models in the fridge and I'm going to see how long it takes before they go mouldy. Any case, I think you need to get the background information before we start measuring bladder volumes. And uh, this was the talk I made to go with the models. Now, the first thing to say is that this is simple. If a machine can measure bladder volumes, you can do it, and you can do it better than the machine. I guess it's a bit tricky with many of our patients who have these huge aprons, and you'd think it might be hard to find the bladder. But I've got to say that um, there's some fairly reliable anatomy underneath. For example, we have the pubic synthesis, which sits at the same place in just about everyone, and that's the bit we're aiming for. You've got to lift that apron up and feel the hard bone underneath, just where the hair stops. Uh, usually I say if you're not down low enough, if you're not a little bit embarrassed, you're probably too high. So imagine this patient lying down here. Um, we'll have to ask someone to pull the apron back. We're aiming to put our probe just um, above the pubic symphysis, which I've got here is the uh, green bones. We've got the bladder sitting underneath. Now most people make the mistake of pointing the beam too high up towards the sacrum. In actual fact, you might miss a small bladder. What we need to do is remember that pelvis is like a bowl. We have to look down into the bowl uh, and fan the beam towards the gluteal cleft. And this is the way we look for the very small bladders. Now, so long as you're low enough sitting right on the bone, you should be able to find even the smallest of bladders here. And we'll have a look what these look like next. We're aiming for two views, long and trans. It's transverse because the muscles are overlying it are sort of symmetrical and even. You fan up and down until you get the widest black bubble. The one on the right is what we call longitudinal, where we have one end of the probe sitting on the pubic symphysis and the muscles of the abdomen are sort of asymmetrical and they end on the screen right on the pubic symphysis, which usually has a black shadow underneath it like this. Now that second picture you'll notice we've taken two measurements. So what we're going to, oh, that's the pubic symphysis here. What we're going to end up is three measurements, one across the width of the bladder, and then two at right angles, getting the length and the depth of the bladder. This is all that your, um, your ultrasound machine does, the, the um, automatic one. And it takes these three measurements, the length and the height and the depth, and it multiplies them by 0.52. If you look at this particular one, you'll see the measurements down on the bottom left of each picture, 7.72, 6.68, and 4.20. We multiply them by 0.52 and get a rough ladder volume. Now, I've really got to, to um, tell you that we're only aiming for a rough estimate because you can imagine you could put those uh, calipers in slightly different places and you get differences by a few mils. We're not aiming for perfect figures. Sometimes for example a bladder is huge and it doesn't even fit on the screen. In fact you're allowed to sort of hedge your bets or, or fudge. If you've had a look at the bladder and you know it just does curl to a little round top above there you put your marker about where you think it would be ending. The picture on the right has a shadow on the right of the screen, but again, we'll put our marker where we know the bladder ends. You'll notice this patient, by the way, has a rectal gas shadow directly behind the bladder. That means it's probably male. Now here's another two pictures um, of the bladder, transverse and long. The bladder transverse isn't always um, symmetrical. Sometimes it's indented by bowel contents or ovarian cysts. In this particular one, you'll notice there's something else behind the bladder, not just rectal gas. 
this is a female and so we have the vaginal stripe in the top picture we've got the cervix in the second picture and we've even got believe it or not some free fluid behind the uterus in this patient now it is important since we're going to plan to be smarter than the AI it's important to know where the machine can go wrong some things that look like fluid are not well in this case this is fluid but it's not the bladder in this picture that is the bladder that little empty thing squished down and the fluid directly above it is actually free abdominal fluid as in the cites or in this particular patient this was blood here's another instance of a patient who's got a hemoperitoneum on the top picture we can see the bladder on the right and we can see a sort of a, a mid gray shape in the middle of the picture that's actually free blood the picture on the bottom is the transverse view and you can see the sort of the almost square shaped bladder but we can also see some dark fluid around either side that's fluid that's uh, sunk down into the pelvis now occasionally people with huge ascites have a great lot of fluid above the symphysis pubis but if you look closely you see weird internal projections that's actually bowel that's floating in the free fluid I'm not sure where this patient's bladder is I don't think it's on this picture at all certainly an empty bladder may be hiding behind the shadow of the pubic symphysis now just occasionally you will see some really weird things and it's not for you to diagnose what they are but show someone this one for example is a bladder with sludge a layer of sludge at the bottom this one believe it or not is a blood clot and if you'd seen it waving around freely it would make more sense and this one is a blood of diverticulum um, they can even develop strange things in them such as stones they are definitely a pay grade higher than you or I though I would be referring these on so I think since we can do more than just calculate bladder volumes we should look a little bit about how we can use the ultrasound to sort out catheter problems and to do this I'm afraid we do have to do a very little bit of brief mandatory physics but I promise not much so the only bit of physics I need you to remember about this is that ultrasound beams act like billiard balls in other words they bounce off flat walls or, or the edges of your billiard table at exactly the same angle that they hit like this and um, if you wanted to put it in fancy science speak you'd say that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection that's only if you want to impress people now obviously if the ball hits the wall at an angle it's not going to bounce back to the ultrasound probe and if the ball doesn't bounce back to the ultrasound probe it's as if it's invisible um, ultrasound can only hear sound waves that are picked up or caught by the probe itself so a, a, a surface like this one at an angle will be almost invisible to an ultrasound that is if it's a flat shiny surface the um, exception to this rule is when the surface is actually rough because if the surface is rough occasionally these uh, ultrasound waves will bounce back to the probe some of them will get lost completely so the surface we see won't be completely bright some of them will do a couple of bounces and um, this is the reason that uh, rough surfaces we can see more easily sometimes than shiny surfaces and it's also the reason that um, people will purposely roughen needles such as ultrasound visible needles uh, if you want to see them better you'll notice the nerve block needles are actually rough that's so the sound waves can be scattered back to the probe now the thing about this or the bad thing about this is that an ultrasound catheter it has, combines all the worst characteristics when it comes to returning beams in other words we have um, a very shiny smooth surface that means only the sound waves directly hitting perpendicularly will bounce back and secondly 
um, it's curved and so it's a bit like walking along a tightrope only the beams hitting the very leading edge will be seen. So if you had a catheter, for example a catheter with air in it, the picture you get on an ultrasound is a bit like this. Um, a curved bright leading edge and then a shadow, which is usually a dirty grey shadow, not a particularly black one, underneath. This often gets lost in bowel gas. Now you'd think that the catheter balloon might be easier, and it's true, when you fill it with water, it becomes easy for the ultrasound to see. But often the catheter balloon has a little bit of gas at the leading edge, so the picture you may see is something like this. The leading edge gas still has that shadow underneath, but you may see the um, black fluid balloon around the edges. But notice again, you don't see the side walls of the balloon. In reality, if you're looking for a catheter in a bladder, it can be very hard to see because if the catheter is working properly, it collapses the um, bladder. And then there's a lot of bowel gas around there, and so um, it can become camouflaged. This is, and I'll turn it on in a minute, a longitudinal suprapubic view, and there's a tiny bit of catheter in the middle of the bladder just here. Now, if you see something like this, you think, whoa, I've, uh, I've actually got the balloon in the bladder. But this is a worry. Something tells me that this bladder isn't emptying. This is not the picture that you should be seeing. You see, there's the, um, the balloon with a little bit of gas in the leading edge. And on the other picture, you'll notice there's an odd, um, bright arc across the bladder, that's a thing we call side lobe artifact. It's not real, it doesn't move. You've got to learn what these artifacts look like, they can be quite annoying. Now this one's not good either. This is where we actually have a very big irregular prostate and a small bladder. You might have difficulty getting a catheter into this one. There's also some diverticulum at the edges. This is another one that can and does completely upset uh, both your artificial intelligence and even real sonographers. This was uh, an extremely large ovarian cyst that was repeatedly um, misidentified as an overly full bladder. In fact, if you look at the top right-hand picture on the right-hand screen, that was actually the catheter balloon in a very squished bladder off to the side. Knowing about these things can make you a bit smarter than the machine. Now, if you want to, you can actually use the ultrasound to interact with the catheter and find out what it's doing. This particular one was a suprapubic catheter that didn't seem to be working. And when we looked at it and jiggled it, we could see it was coming in through the abdominal wall, but then it was actually going out the urethra, I think, through the prostate. And that's why it wasn't working. What we did was we reinserted it and then just to make sure it was in the right place we inflated the balloon and you can see the balloon getting bigger properly in the bladder this time. And this one worked. Um, here's another suprapubic catheter gone astray. Now this patient, um, the suprapubic catheter wasn't uh, draining. The first uh, bladder scan seemed to show that there was a lot of urine in the bladder so we placed in a urethral catheter. Now on the picture on the top we've actually got the symphysis pubis, it's a bone so it has a shadow underneath it but if you watch just here you'll notice jiggling so we started to jiggle the urethral catheter to see that it was in the right place. You can see there, yep, we're actually definitely doing something that's definitely urethral catheter in approximately the right place. And here, what we did was we squirted some fluid in. Now, fluid often has bubbles, and the bubbles are what gives it that white flash. So it does appear to be going into the bladder, even though it's pretty indistinct. Okay, so we thought, where is the suprapubic catheter going? We put the uh, probe over the um, abdominal wall where the catheter goes in. Now a catheter of course is another one of those long shiny things so it doesn't actually shadow very well. 
and you can see it going through the abdominal wall but then it takes a, a turn and appears to be going actually up the abdominal wall. This is the patient's head end here. In other words, it's taking a big loop like this, which is definitely going the wrong direction for the bladder. In fact, when we follow it up further, we find this. This is definitely the catheter balloon, and it's embedded somewhere in the rectus abdominis. We squirted a little bit of fluid in. It didn't particularly hurt the patient, but it certainly wasn't going in the bladder. So in summary, um, you can do better than a, a bladder scanner because you can start to recognize things that may give false positives and false negatives and you can use the ultrasound machine to interact with the catheter to see where it is and is it working. When you do put the catheter on it's important to scan low enough to feel just a little bit embarrassed right down just above the bones of the symphysis pubis and most of the patients uh, overhanging aprons will reflect off this uh, bony eminence and they're not usually, as long as you've got someone hold, large to hold the um, apron back, you usually can see the bladder. You must remember that if the bladder is empty it will be hiding down within the bowl of the pelvis so you have to point your torch beam or your ultrasound beam down into the pelvis not up into the abdomen. And finally, the sum to remember to keep in your phone is length by width by depth by 0.52. And um, it's not going to be super accurate, it's user dependent, but hey, we're just after a ballpark part figure. So I hope this has been useful. Um, I'll tell you when uh, the models get mouldy and I'll try and bring some more in for next time. Thank you.